Today, I want to talk with you about the neurologic examination. To some students, it's a dreaded examination, but I hope at the end of this presentation, you would have gained some confidence in performing this examination. I'd like to start by reviewing the anatomy of the brain and spinal cord and the layout of the central nervous system. The central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. It is responsible for receiving sensory information and giving the corresponding motor functions. It stores memories and emotions. The peripheral nervous system consists of both cranial nerves and spinal nerves. It transmits information to and from the brain to the rest of the body. The peripheral nervous system can be divided into somatic nervous system, which is responsible for voluntary muscle movements, and also the autonomic nervous system, which is responsible for involuntary action. The autonomic nervous system can be divided into the sympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for fight or flight response, or the parasympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for rest and relaxed action. The brain. The brain has four regions, the cerebrum, the diencephalon, the brainstem, and the cerebellum. The brain has two hemispheres, the left and the right. It is the cerebrum that is divided into the two hemispheres. Each cerebrum has a frontal lobe, a parietal lobe, a temporal lobe, and an occipital lobe. There are two types of brain tissue, gray matter and white matter. Gray matter consists of nerve cell bodies, which are found on the surface of the cerebrum. They form the cerebral cortex. White matter consists of axons that are covered with myelin. It's the myelin that gives the white appearance. The myelin sheet also allows nerve impulse to travel at a very rapid speed. The cerebrum. It has a frontal lobe, a parietal lobe, an occipital lobe, and a temporal lobe, as we said before. The frontal lobe is responsible for voluntary skeletal movement. It is also responsible for speech in the broken area. The parietal lobe, it receives sensory input relating to temperature, pressure, pain, two-point discrimination, and auditory sensations. The occipital lobe is responsible for the primary vision center where visual data are interpreted. The temporal lobe, in this lobe, there's perception and interpretation of sounds, Wernicke speech area where the written and spoken words are understood, and it's also involved in um, taste, smell, and balance. The cerebellum. The cerebellum is involved in voluntary movements, sensory information from the eyes, air, touch receptors, and musculoskeletal system are processed in the cerebellum. The sensory information processed in the cerebellum is used to control muscle tone, equilibrium, and posture. The cerebellum is also integrated with the vestibular system. The brain stem. The brain stem includes the medulla oblongata, the pons, the midbrain, and the diencephalon. It is the pathway between the spinal cord and the cerebral cortex. The nuclei or cell bodies are located in the brain stem. The limbic system. The limbic system includes the hypothalamus, which regulates the pituitary gland and deals with hunger, thirst, body temperature, and pleasure. It also includes the amygdala, which is involved in aggression and fear. And thirdly, it involves or includes the hippocampus, which process memory. Here's a schematic of the brain. So now let's talk about the neurologic exam. There are five components to the neurologic examination. The minimental status, cranial nerves, cerebellum, sensory and motor functions, and the deep tendon reflexes. 
Now, the mini mental status exam includes alertness, awareness, memory, speech, judgment, and effect. In terms of alertness, the patient should be conscious. Alertness is a brainstem function. The reticular activating system is responsible for alertness. Awareness, the patient should be aware regarding person, place, and time. The cortex is responsible for awareness. Um, so we can ask a patient about who is the president, where they're located, and what time it is. And then we have the expression that the patient is alert and oriented times three. Memory is an X, and we should check for both short-term memory and long-term memory. Short-term memory, we can give the patient three objects to remember. Long-term memory, we can ask them about their place of birth. Then we can evaluate the person's speech. Can they articulate? Judgment can be evaluated by providing a scenario that would evaluate the person's honesty. And then the effect is to establish how the patient um, face a pair. Next, we want to talk about the cranial nerves. There are 12 cranial nerves. Cranial nerve one is the olfactory, which is sensory. This tests the ability to identify odor. Cranial nerve two is the optic, which is sensory also. This evaluates the visual acuity, visual field, and the fundus. Cranial nerve three is the ocular motor. It opens the eye. It innervates all the extraocular muscles except the lateral rectus and the superior oblique, and it causes pupillary reaction. Cranial nerve four is trochlear. It's also motor. It innervates the superior oblique and pulls the eye downward. Cranial nerve five is a trigeminal. It's motor and sensory. The three sensory branches are the ophthalmic, the maxillary, and the mandibular. It causes corneal reflex. It innervates the temporalis muscle, causing clinching of the teeth, and the masseter muscle, causing jaw movements. Cranial nerve six is the abducens. It's motor and it innervates the lateral rectus. Cranial nerve seven is the facial nerve. It is motor and sensory. It is responsible for facial movements. It is also responsible for taste in the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Cranial nerve eight is the acoustic. It is sensory. It carries sound impulses from the trochlear to the brain. Both Weber and Rhine tests are performed. Cranial nerve 9 and 10 are the glossopharyngeal and the vagus nerves. They are both motor and sensory, and are responsible for raising the soft palate. Of such, the uvula should be midline, and the gag reflex should be present. If the glossopharyngeal on the right is not functioning, as in the case of a stroke, the uvula will be pulled to the left. The glossopharyngeal is also responsible for taste in the posterior one-third of the tongue. The, vas the vagus nerve is responsible for the parasympathetic innervation of the heart. Cranial nerve 11, which is a spinal nerve, it's motor, and it innervates the trapezius to raise the shoulder and the sternocleidomastoid to turn the head laterally. The right sternocleidomastoid muscle causes the head to turn to the left and vice versa. Cranial nerve 12 is the hypoglossal. It is motor and it is responsible for tongue movement. Each nerve innervates one half of the tongue. If the right hypoglossal is dysfunctional, the tongue will deviate to the right. This is because the normally functioning left half will dominate as it no longer has opposition from the right. Similarly, the tongue would have limited or absent ability to resist against pressure applied from outside the left cheek. Next component is the cerebellar exam. This includes finger to nose, rapid alternating hand movements, heel to shin, tandem gait, 
Romberg and pronated drift. The next component is the motor. In this, um, all muscle groups as it relates to flexion and extension should be tested bilaterally and in the upper and lower extremities. The sensory component is the next. Um, the, there should be testing of the sensation bilaterally on the face and in the upper and lower extremities. Next, we have the deep tendon reflexes. Hyperreflexia is an upper motor neuron deficit and hyperreflexia is a lower motor neuron deficit. Biceps, triceps, brachioradialis, and the patella and Achilles tendons should be tested. The biceps are innervated by C5, C6, and the musculocutaneous nerve. Triceps are innervated by C7, C8, and the radial nerve. The brachioradialis are innervated by the C5, C6, and the radial nerve. The patella is innervated by L3, L4, and the femoral nerve and the Achilles tendon is innervated by S1, S2, and the sciatic nerve. A special test that should be done is the Babinski test. If the test is positive, the big toe will dorsiflex and the rest of the toes will fan out. This represents an upper motor neuron deficit. If the test is negative, the toes will plant or flex. Well, this wraps up the brief overview of the neurologic exam. But before I go, um, I'd like to summarize what I talked about. The brain has maybe divided into two lobes. It has the cerebrum, which is the largest portion, a cerebellum, and the brainstem. The brainstem consists of the medulla oblongata, the pons, the midbrain, and the diencephalon. The neurologic exam has five components, the mini mental status, the cranial nerves, the cerebellum, the motor and sensory, and the deep tendon reflexes. Well, I hope this short presentation has provided a framework within which you will build your own structure of information and knowledge, and I wish you well. Good night.